Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Nights Podcast. Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with the juice to get you through the long night. And on today's episode of Obsidian Nights, we are doing a Game of Thrones at our nine. And I am joined by Damon. Damon, would you like to introduce yourself to the sweet summer family? Let them know who you are. And- Peace, sweet summer family. My name is Damon Stith. And um, I am a uh, study uh, historical and medieval African martial arts. Uh, specializing in swordsmanship. So So we have you for like the perfect chapter, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) We got you for a chapter that has a sword fight in it. Yeah. (laughs) So I was actually, when I was doing the reread of this chapter for this episode, I had forgotten how sad this chapter is, like towards the end of it. Um, Overall, what was your take on the chapter as a whole before we start breaking it down well so for me it was a it it was like a being doused with like cold water i remember my first time um actually reading uh game of thrones uh years and years ago and i was new to the new to the genre and i had certain expectations um and so when when uh you know when the way that that Ned is 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 poised as like the um, the hero of the story, you know I just found myself on the edge of the seat like you know just like man this can't happen to the hero this is not the way it's supposed to go, and so I was kind of reliving that trauma if you will, <laughs> um, uh, during during my reread. Yeah, it's kind of like when you read it here and you think, oh, is he dead? It kind of like. I won't say it softens the blow, but it kind of makes you think that he's not really going to die in that Arya chapter that he dies in. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the chapter opens up and it says, he found Littlefinger in the brothel's common room, chatting amiably with a tall, elegant woman who wore a feathered gown over a skin as black as ink. By the hearth, Huard and a buxom wench were playing at forfeits, From the look of it, he'd lost his belt, his cloak, his male shirt, and his right boot so far, while the girl had been forced to unbutton her shift to the waist. Jory Cassell stood beside a rain streak window with a weary smile on his face, watching who were turn over tiles and enjoying the view. So I remember in Game of Thrones when they had when they did this brothel scene and Jory was kind of just standing there. (laughs) Just kind of standing there, just staring, looking shocked. Yeah, yeah, that 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 um, goofy look, the uh, deer in the headlights, kind of like you've never seen anything like that. Like that, to me, I think this kind of highlights the idea of like uh, the quote unquote like southern corruption. Just kind of like what what Robert was kind of describing to Ned to entice him um, about the South. Is this kind of is that it just kind of stands in juxtaposition of the uh, the 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 Northerners and their naivety and and innocence in in a certain way. Yeah, it does. That's a good point. I think, so let's just, I'll just say that. So this is the brothel scene where Ned Stark, where Littlefinger tells Ned Stark, you know, don't leave. Um, In the last chapter, he told Ned not to leave. And Ned goes ahead and stays in King's Landing to go to this brothel. And this is the last place that John Aaron went before he died. So Baelish, Littlefinger, he... I talked about this in another episode. He likes to mock Ned Stark yeah. any chance he can. And he does it here. Like he mocks Ned because, but Ned does ask like a stupid question. Like <laughs> Ned does ask dumbass questions. Like Ned says, is this your business or Robert's? They say the hand dreams, the King's dreams speak with, the, speaks with the King's voice and rules with the King's swords. Does that also mean you fuck with the King's t- <laughs> and he didn't finish it, but you know what he was going to say. Yeah. And Ned is like, 
Um, look, I'm just about done. I'm grateful that you're helping me, but I'm just about done with all the mockery that you keep giving me because it's been like every interaction with them is little finger mocking Ned. Right. Right. That, that sharp tongue. And it's, it's, it's funny, like looking back at it and knowing, knowing what little finger knows, how he's kind of dangling the truth, kind of in fr- the whole truth in front of his, uh, in front of his face. And it's like, we kind of get to see just how, um, how devious he is, you know, uh, from his perspective, just, just from us knowing what we know. Yeah. And I, I have no idea why no one just outright told him why they took him on this goose chase, but like you, they all knew Varys knew and Littlefinger knew everybody knew. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I really liked about this chapter is the, like, the description of the chapter is super gloomy. Like yeah. the rain, the black starless sky, like it's gloomy. And when on reread, I don't know if you would pick this up the first time you read it, but on reread, I've just felt like the it was just setting up a doom and gloom kind of chapter. Yeah, yeah. So it has been a long time since I read 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 this. Um and again, I, I was um, just kind of going through it and and just more caught up with what's going to happen with the character than than actually the the some of the finer points in the in the chapter. But um, doing during my reread, um, I I felt very much like the, the 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 darkness, the gray that was kind of like painted in the in the scene, and you know then. I had to kind of, the funny thing is like, I'm, I'm remembering this scene in the, uh, the uh, series. And again, it's like a total different take, like the, the, uh, the lighting and the, the colors, the, uh, the occasion was very, very different um, in comparison to this chapter. It was very different. I mean, everything basically was different about it. And I still think though, in the show, it was powerful, and I did like that they had Ned and Jamie kind of sword fighting a little bit or whatever. But it was like daylight, I think. It wasn't raining. It, it wasn't dark and gloomy. And even towards the end of this chapter, like, I'll we'll talk about it when I get there. But the way that Ned Stark describes the Red Keep as looking like a bleeding, it looks bloody to him. It, it's just like this chapter is dark. Yeah, most definitely. There was... I like some of the glimpses of um, just as Ned is kind of realizing the truth about the uh, uh, Robert's bastards. You know, he's also kind of realizing the truth about Robert and um, you you get to see some, 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 um, you get to see some of Liana in this chapter, which is, uh, which is really good to to see. Um, Yes. Yes. Um, It says, the, it says the streets of King's Landing were dark and deserted. The rain had driven everyone under their roofs. It beat down on Ned's head, warm as blood and relentless as old guilt. Fat drops of water ran down his face. Robert will never keep to one bed, Liana had told him at Winterfell on the night long ago when their father had promised her hand to young Lord of Storm's End. I hear he has gotten a child on some girl in the Vale. Ned had held the babe in his arms. He could scarcely deny her, nor would he lie to his sister. But he had assured her that what Robert did before their betrothal was of no matter, that he was a good man and true who would love her with all his heart. Liana had only smiled. Love is sweet, dearest Ned, but it cannot change a man's nature. Yep, yep, yep. Um, that... Also, that that uh, reading this, and of co- of course with Liana, you see how you know Rhaegar isn't too far behind in the story. Um, there were like little bitty points um, where where uh, George was kind of kind of causing us to question a narrative about about Rhaegar, um, particularly like this him through through Ned asking questions if 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 uh, Rhaegar was the type of guy that would be in a in to, to visit brothels or to to mm-hmm. do something that Robert was was doing, and I, I thought that was really interesting storytelling because we at that point, and especially going back to my original time with the story, 
you know, we're, we're thinking, or I was thinking that Rhaegar was this like fiend and this bastard who had, you know, kidnapped this girl. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, you know, Ned, who's, whose uh, moral character is someone that we can rely on and we kind of trust throughout the story, you know, with him, have with him questioning that it, it was a, a good way to kind of sow the seeds of possibly the story of Rhaegar and uh, Lyanna being something uh, a little more than meets the eye. Right. Because Ned really never has a bad thought about Rhaegar. Right. He never thinks about him negatively. Even when he thinks about him wanting to visit, visit Bra- D- does Rhaegar visit brothels often? I think not. <laughs> so he doesn't, he doesn't think of Rhaegar as like a deviant or whatever. Right. But I, I did like the part where Ned is like the water, the rain is beating down on him. Mm -hmm. like as relentless as old guilts. And when he thinks of the old guilts, he thinks of Liana. Exactly. Exactly. That was probably like my favorite line um, in the whole chapter. Just that, just the, the, um, the idea of what Ned is carrying with him, you know, Um, thought that was like, that stood out to me when I read, reread the chapter. Yeah, it stood out to me too. And I wonder like what he feels guilty about because the story as we're told, he really doesn't have anything to feel guilty about unless he feels guilty about not keeping his promise to Liana because we don't necessarily know what his promise to Liana was. Right. We can speculate what we think it was which would have been to protect John or maybe she was like, promise me you will make sure he gets his birthright, which is the throne. And maybe Ned promised that and broke that promise because I find it hard to believe that Liana wanted her son, the rightful heir to the iron throne to be sent to the wall. Right. And I think Ned might have some guilt about that. Yeah. So when I first started reading the book, um, decades ago, it feels like, um, I was uh, I was really wanting to uh, for Ned to be able to fulfill his promise to John about telling him about his mother, mm-hmm. and um, when you know in the back of my mind I'm always waiting for him to get to this point to 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 be able to reveal this to to uh, John, and then when he's go when he's you know injured captured and then is killed, and I'm like man now like how you know like how is you know I was really feeling for for John because there's this this big hole in his in his uh, identity and in and in his soul. You know, the person that, that had the answers to his questions, to his identity, to his history, um, had you know was was captured and killed, and there was no way he was going to be able to like fulfill that promise to him. Yeah, I mean that's sad as fuck when you think about it because he doesn't know who his mom is and his dad is the only person that can tell him or his dad air quotes is the only person that can tell him and then you know he's gone so yeah that's really sad but uh, i think i know there's a theory that john will never find out about his mom and like that's the bitter ending is john never finds out who he is but i doubt that we have helen reed in the story that was there with the Ned at the Tower of Joy, we have Bran. The um, we have Brendan Rivers, who's like. Right. So we have people that can actually tell him, which is good. Right, right, yeah. I w- I would think that it's. I could see that possibly as kind of like if it it could go either way. Like I can see like since since the story is based in like realism in a lot of senses, you know in real life, you know, there's a lot of missed opportunities and there's a lot of missed chances to like really know who you are and to, to, to know your history. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see that I can see them going that way on, on the real, but you know, I'm really rooting for John to be able to like, you know, have that piece of himself and to, to, to figure that part out. And I think that it's, it's too big of a thing t- for him to just not know or not, not uh, discover that. Cause it's, it's part of his, I think part of his, um, I think it's one of the things that kind of like uh, propels his story is, is yeah. his lack of identity or de- determining or discovering and creating his identity. I think it is too. And I think um, embracing who he is at the end of the day is a part of his hero's journey. 
And I feel like he needs to, he needs to know who his dad yeah. is. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so when Ned Stark gets to the brothel, he, they take him to meet a young girl. She has red hair and freckles and she has a baby and her baby is named Bera and it is Robert Baratheon's bastard daughter. So Robert, um, Robert. <laughs> so Ned Stark touches the baby's hair. The baby has fine, dark hair, um, black as silk. And Ned remembers Robert's firstborn daughter, which was Maya Stone, who was present in the last chapter in the Vale um, with Catelyn. Mm. And the the girl says, tell him that when you see him, my lord, as it as it please you, tell him how beautiful she is. I will, Ned had promised her. That was his curse. Robert would swear undying love and forget them before evenfall, but Ned Stark kept his vows. He thought of the promises he'd made Lyanna as she lay dying and the price he'd paid to keep them. So he must have kept those promises. And maybe Lyanna was like, look, raise him as your son. Tell no one who he is. And the price that he feels that he paid to keep them was probably issues with his wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, how John was raised, and right. how and and at the end of the day, like raising John as your son, forsakes his claim to the throne. It for it forsakes his birthright. Right, right. And I'm sure he feels guilty. Like at this point, he feels like he's going to tell John who his mother is and all of this stuff. And I'm sure he feels guilty that by the time he's going to tell John who he is, John has already sworn his night's watch vows and has given up all claims to titles and lands right and it's like yeah it's kind of fucked up yeah it is <laughs> yeah and i i kind of think that maybe the first mandate of her of her promise was to keep him was to keep him safe you know yeah um and you know this is this is probably the best way that that ned knew how to to do that so this is a, a a tad bit off subject, but uh, speaking of like uh, bastards in Winterfell, um, how there's lots of theories out there, right? Concerning mm-hmm. you know the 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 um, the more Tully looking um, children of of uh, Catelyn. Do you think that there's any any um, weight to that? That maybe uh, and I'm not Tully's. I mean they're Tully's, but I mean like um, possibly that like Brandon. Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if that's possibly the son of uh of uh Ned's brother. Um, so I've always thought it was like fifty fifty mm-hmm. that Rob Stark was actually Brandon Stark's and Catelyn's kid because Catelyn hates Jon Snow so much. Yeah. And I'm like, well if Rob and is Ned Stark's true born son, why do you hate John so much? Why do you act like John is such a threat? to your children like in the dance with dragons queen allicent hates rhaenyra and doesn't want rhaenyra to be on the throne because rhaenyra's children are actually bastards and they're even though they're the heirs to the throne her children queen allicent's children who are true born targaryens would still be she feels like their lives would be right yeah yeah so i mean i don't necessarily say if it is i feel like it's one of those things that we'll never know i mean brandon was definitely a hoe like (laughs) he was definitely out there doing stuff and he was in river run and i don't know like i don't think catlin is the most honorable woman that people love to say that she is so i do feel like there's definitely a lot of evidence that says that Rob is Brandon's, but there's also a lot of evidence that says that Rob is Ned's. So it's like 50, 50, we might not ever find out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. True indeed. So, um, in the brothel, Ned is kind of like, you know, um, he doesn't really know why they're there. He doesn't really get it. Like, so they're riding they're riding away and ned just sees john snow's face in front of him and i feel like this is one of the most the chapters that has the most rlj yeah. foreshadowing in it cuz we get two times he's flashing back to liana and now he's flashing back to john's face 
And but it also makes it seem like it's John is Ned's son in this chapter because he's like, um, Ned saw John Snow's face in front of him, so like a younger version of his own. If the gods frowned so on bastards, he thought, why did they fill men with such lust? Lord Baelish, what do you know of Robert's bastards? Well, he has more than you for a start, mocking Ned <laughs> again. And then he tells, asks him how many. And Littlefinger is like, does it matter? Because it doesn't really matter how many, like the point that Robert has bastards isn't the reason that Ned, isn't the reason that Baelish brought him there. So he's kind of like, you still don't get it. Like, you still don't get it. That's what Littlefinger is basically saying when he says, does it matter? Um, He says, if you bet enough women, some will give you presents. And his grace has never been shy on that account. And then they talk about Edric Storm. Um, which is the boy at Storm's End. So on Stannis' wedding night, Robert betted Lady Salisa's niece. Mm-hmm. Was it her niece? Yeah, her yep. niece. Robert had sex with her and got her pregnant, and that is Edric's mom. Um, and then Stannis was like, it's an affront on his wife's house, and the boy was um, sent to be raised by Renly and that's Edric Storm and they also talk about the twins um the serving twins at Cashley Rock uh so a wench a serving wench had twins supposedly by Robert at Cashley Rock and Cersei had them killed and their mother sold into slavery right and Ned Stark is like, well, you know, people say that bad shit about all kinds of lords, but for some reason, I believe it of Cersei Lannister. <laughs> like, I believe she would do that. But um, Ned is kind of like asking the right questions. Like, why is John Aaron? Why does John Aaron want to know about the king's base born children? Right. And no one wants to like help Ned find the answer, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of feel almost like um, it, it's one of those situations where, you know, the, you they want to see like how much um, how, how much uh, Ned is willing to like play ball. How much is he willing to really, really see mm-hmm. before like certain plans get put into action? Um, and when he's connecting the dots and just kind of circling back to uh, John and Liana, when he's connecting the dots about, uh, well, the dots are being connected for us as far as like the the hair color and the look of the children. And then when we hear that, we hear how, again, George R. R. Martin is being very, very, you know, tricksy with his, with his, with his words, because he's playing like literary algebra with us in a sense, because he's saying how, you know, Ned is looking and thinking how much John looks like him, you know, how mm-hmm. much, but at the same time, that you know, uh, Ned and 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 it doesn't make a, a light bulb go off for Ned, right? Right, right, right. But I mean, for us, for the for us as the readers, you know, when it's saying how much John looks like Ned, you know, Ned, Arya, Lyanna, they have those true stark features, and so we're connecting John to to Ned when we should when. It's another way of saying that John also bears that same features features with Liana. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. And then in the same chapter, he thinks about Rhaegar Targaryen. <laughs> so yeah. it's putting all the R plus L equals J breadcrumbs out there. And I feel like when I was reading this back, I feel like, well, really all the Eddard chapters. I feel like ever since Ned got to King's Landing, like Littlefinger and Varys were making him like a project, like yeah. a lab rat kind of, and just watching him run a maze where they already knew what was, they already knew what he wanted to know, and they just watched him run the maze. Right. Let's see right. how he finds it. Let's see how fast he can think on his feet. So yeah. it starts raining a lot harder. Um, again, it's very gloomy. It's, it says that rivers of black water were running down the hill. And Jory calls out to Ned Stark in the street is full of soldiers. So uh, <laughs> Jamie Lannister. Uh, 
Jamie Lannister comes in. It says, Ned glimpsed ringmail over leather, gauntlets and greaves, steel helms with golden lions on the crest. Their cloaks clung to their backs, sodden with rain. He had no time to count, but there were 10 at least, a line of them on foot blocking the street with long swords and iron tipped spears. Behind, he heard Will cry. And when he turned his horse, there were more in back of them, cutting off their retreat. Jory's sword came singing from the scabbard, make way or die. And then Jamie comes through like, the wolves are howling. <laughs> He's yes. such an asshole. J- Jamie is. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says, he says, the wolves are howling, their leader said. Ned could see rain running down his face. Such a small pack, though. Like, it's yeah. just, it's, uh, it's not cool. Yeah, yeah. So... I- and Littlefinger, he's so dramatic. Littlefinger is like, what is the meaning of this? This is the hand of the king. And Jamie's like, he was the hand of the king. Like, he's not anymore. Yeah. yeah. And I, this is one of the, the most interesting exchanges. Mm-hmm. And also, it's one of the saddest endings to a chapter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, Littlefinger's like, I'm going to go get the city watch. Um, Jamie's like, you remember my brother, don't you, Lord Stark? He was with us at Winterfell. Fair hair, mismatched eyes, sharp of tongue, a short man. I remember him well, Ned replied. It would seem he has met some trouble on the road. My Lord Father is quite vexed. You would not perchance have any notion of who might have wished my brother ill, would you? And then Ned is like, your brother has been taken at my command to answer for his crimes. And then Littlefinger's like, oh, my lord. <laughs> like, what is going on? And then he wants, like, Jamie, like, pulls his sword out and he's like, show me your steel, Lord Eddard, or I'll butcher you like Ares if I must, but I'd sooner you died with a blade in your hand. Um, yeah, so it's about to go down in the streets of King's Yep, Lake. yep. yep. <laughs> You know, this, despite despite Jamie Lannister's ass holiness, mm-hmm. in that one last uh, paragraph you read, it does show a glimpse of his idea of honor and a fair fight, in a mm-hmm. sense. You know, and to be honest, like I don't necessarily blame Jamie for attacking Ned Stark because he's acting in retaliation at the end of the day. Like right. he has a soft spot for Tyrion and yeah. your wife has taken Tyrion. So now, and then you're going to tell me to my face why you're surrounded by soldiers that, why you're surrounded by my soldiers that you told her to do it. So right. I don't blame Jamie at all. Yeah, yeah. And I do think, you know, that he, him wanting Ned to have his sword in his hand and not, he doesn't, he doesn't just want to slaughter Ned in the street, even right. though he could. Right, right, yeah. Uh, uh, again, I think that the, the, um, the uh, we see him as, as pompous and, it, you know, we got to remember the times that he's, that he's living in and the times that, that, that they're living in and, of course, he's not. He he has to. He's carrying himself in a certain way to to uh, demonstrate his 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 power and his his ability. And you know, so the, some of that some of that bluster comes off um, while he's talking. And I think that this kind of sets the stage for him when he actually starts to you know go on his redemptive arc. Because uh, I, I will be honest, like Jamie Lannister is one of my guilty pleasure um, characters that I, I kind of I root for him in a way um, to to uh, kind of make to get his to get his uh, his uh, get back on his hero's arc in a sense. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? His redemption. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm told I he is one of my favorite book characters, and when you really get his POVs. It changes how you view him. Right. It really right. does. 
Um, but Jamie, so Jamie is like, you know, I would kill you. Ned's like, you can't kill me. Like, cause Catelyn has your brother. And he's like, you know, you're right. I won't, I won't kill you. I don't think your wife will kill him, but I'm not going to take my chances. And he says, so I suppose I'll let you run back to Robert to tell him how, how I frightened you. I wonder if he'll care. And that's so true. Like Mm -hmm. Robert should have. If Robert had any balls and any brains, he would have checked that shit. But yeah. he, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Robert is a is a tragic character in that um, he he's like the the um, the hero that rose to power by like the the the, the strength and the skill of his warhammer. But he, he's the perfect example of he's not he's not a good king. He's maybe a good war leader and a good warrior, a good fighter, but not a, it's not the same thing as being a good a good king and a good leader. Right. And in this specific fight, so what's different from the show is that Ned and Jory and Ned's men are on horses. Mm-hmm. So Jamie's like, okay, kill his men. Basically, like I'm not gonna let him leave here unscathed so kill his men um jory's fighting ned's fighting um and ned kind of tells jory like jory go away like away away and ned's horse slips because he remember it's raining it's nighttime so ned's ned's horse slips and comes crashing down in the mud and like falls on him and Ned is just like, there was a moment of blinding pain and the taste of blood in his mouth. And then he sees them cut the legs from Jory's horse and drag Jory to the ground and just like stab him repeatedly. Right. And Ned actually can't walk. Like he tries to get up, but he can't walk because he has a splintered bone poking through his calf from where the horse had fell on him. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's so sad. And um, Littlefinger finally comes back with the city watch and they find Ned in the street and he's cradling Jory's body in his arms. And it's yeah. just like, that is one of the saddest parts of it. But this imagery is, it says, he remembered seeing the red keep looming ahead of him in the first gray light of dawn. The rain had darkened the pale pink stone of the massive walls to the color of blood. And I'm just like, Ned ultimately dies there. So Ned seeing the red key, well, he dies at the Sept of Baylor, but right at the same time, his, like all the shit that goes wrong with Ned happens at the red keep. So for him to get the imagery of a bleeding bloody castle that he's returning to, it kind of spells that he's doomed. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 This is bringing back so many memories for me. (laughs) Yeah. I was seriously like waiting. I was like, okay, 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 okay. He's, (laughs) he's, 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 he's going to heal. And he's going to get better. He's going to get stronger. And then he's going to, you know, get get his revenge and things are going to be right. And, um, man, when he um, when he was killed, like I was not like I was not prepared for that at all. Like I yeah. was I was not prepared. I was shocked, too. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I was shocked. So um, Ned gets back and Grandmaster Pycelle is kind of like looming over him, holding a cup, whispering, drink, my lord, here, the milk of the poppy for your pain. He remembered swallowing and Pycelle was telling someone to heat the wine to boiling and fetch him clean silk. And that was the last he knew. And that's how the chapter ends. So overall, it's a short chapter, but it is a really good chapter and it's really sad. Yeah. Yeah. And it has a lot of foreshadowing with the R plus L equals J stuff and just the gloominess of what is King's Landing. Right, right, exactly. So did you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, I wanted to say this is slightly off topic, but um, I've been reading uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. Ah, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. My favorite. And um, I was not prepared for, like, to see, like, how... um, how influential that that (laughs) everybody tells me that 
when the first time they read the dragon bone chair. Yes. Like it's, you can, it's, yeah, it's real similar. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely. I think that George, um, George has, uh, done, you know, is a, is a wizard with, with, with words and with writing, but it's, you know, it's, it's, I can, I can definitely see lots of points of, of connection there. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't finished it yet, so I wonder if it'll reveal and spoil some of the stuff for uh, for a song of ice and fire. It it does, and it doesn't. So I think the main similarity between Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn and A Song of Ice and Fire is that they uh, both authors Ted Williams and George R. R. Martin are using mythology real world mythology and folklore and they're twisting it and incorporating it in their stories so like um in in memory sorrow and thorn we had the city which is mm-hmm. totally children of the forest in, in game with, in a song of ice and fire right. and then you have like in a who is total night king vibes <laughs> in a song of ice and fire or white walker vibes even the cloud children are white walker vibes exactly yeah so i don't necessarily think it will spoil but i kind of do got you because i feel like what uh, what book are you on uh the farewell stone farewell stone have you you've heard the three sword prophecy then right yeah yeah yeah. so i think that three sword prophecy without saying anything else i think that twist may spoil it got you okay but i won't say anything else <laughs> i i thought there was something in connection because you know how we're always trying to figure out the mystery of uh valerian still mm-hmm and um, I thought that um, uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn offered some really interesting perspective on on the creation of these like these um, these magic blades that are combining like metal and other you know yeah. natural objects and stuff. So I thought that was like you know because I've heard theories saying uh, discuss you know talking about like you know the 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 how to make Valerian steel and you know of course dragon fire and you know. But then I've I've heard stuff about, you know, somehow Werewoods being in connection with that. So Yeah, did you see the um the video that I did on the forging of sorrow and how I think that could be Valerian steel George could have be using like Valerian steel yeah, towards yeah. that. And and maybe not even just Valerian steel, but like sorrow, the forging of sorrow reminds me so much of Lightbringer. Right. Right. The uh, foreshadowing, like you said, for um, Rhaegar and Lyanna, the tidbits of information or, or glimpses into Rhaegar's character. But then just like, again, like you said, the, the mood of the, of the chapter being so dark and so dismal. And, you know, uh, I think it just it really sets apart George's work. Because if you are reading, you know, if you're reading fantasy fiction and you're at this point in the story, you know, you're expecting you're expecting a few things. And when the, the quote unquote hero of the story, you know, falls and it doesn't even fall like in a way that's, that's glorious. You know, he falls in a very, you know, simple, Snakes. realistic, it's, clumsy way. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's just like, it, it's just, I, again, I think it just highlights the brilliance of George and his vision with the, with this story. Yeah. It's so realistic. It's so realistic. I, that's what sold me on it because to be honest, I'm not really that big into fantasy. Like I love fantasy. Don't get me wrong. But to me, memory, sorrow and thorn is like that as well, where it doesn't feel like right high fantasy. Like I like Lord of the Rings, but like, I don't like Lord of the Rings. Like I like a song of ice and fire, a song yeah. of ice and fire feels very historically accurate at times, but hey, dragons and stuff. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. T- to be honest, I'm not a not a Lord of the Rings fan at all. I'm more um more uh Elric and um uh Robert Robert Howard's like Conan and Cull. So Elric is actually they're making a series. Someone bought all the rights to Elric. I just seen that the other day. Oh no. So I live in um I live in Austin, <laughs> Texas, right? 
Mm-hmm. And um, there's a small town outside of Austin called Bastrop. And guess who lives in Bastrop, Texas? Tell me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the author of Elric, um, uh, Michael Morcock. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So he, I, I got to meet him in years, years back, and he's a pretty cool dude. But yeah, that that's one of my all time favorites. That's that series. Well, I think they're making. I think it was Stars that bought it. That bought yeah. the rights. Um, I'll have to send you the link of the article that I had read, and I was like, "Oh, they're bringing this to TV. How are they gonna do this?" <laughs> yeah, that scares me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's always scary when it it's less scary when it's a fan of the series of the book series that's doing it. But right, but still, I don't know. But um, if anybody wants to be on Obsidian Nights, hit up Nim's Shadow um, and. Damon, I want to thank you for coming on. Can you let the people know where they can find you? Twitter? Do you have YouTube podcasts? Any of that stuff? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so you can reach me on YouTube. I have a little small YouTube page. It's my name, Damon Stith, um, with an apostrophe between the A and the M. Um, again, I teach uh, historical sword, uh, specializing in African and Middle Eastern sword. And that that's probably the best way, you know. I got the YouTube. I'm still new to Twitter, so I don't really really um work too well with that. But uh Gray, it's been a an honor to share the podcast with you. I will say that I spend most of my time washing dishes listening to listening to the podcast. So you keep me entertained and <laughs> engaged. Um over the over the months so i appreciate the work you do thank you for having oh, me no problem thank you for coming and i will put your youtube channel link in the description box so anybody watching can um just go down into the description box and click the link and you can go right to his channel and see what he's got going on over there as always thanks for watching and i will see you guys next week 